Hello, everybody. It's Jenna. I'm with the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and I'm going to be hosting these tutorials to help you guys figure out how to do the robotic telescope project. This is the first one. So on this one, we are going to be choosing our exoplanet to study. Uh, and to do that, we need to go where all the exoplanet data is, and that's the exoplanet transit finder. So head there. We have a link in the description. There's also going to be a link on your handout, which you will be, uh, hopefully you're following along with that handout and you'll be um, filling that handout out once you've got your target chosen. We need the first link. So this is the Transit Finder Astronomy at Swarthmore College. Now, uh, this will probably say a whole bunch of different things depending on who you are and where you are and how many times you've done this before. Um, first of all, what we're doing is we're pulling up all the information for transits that are visible from our telescope's location. That's the main thing. Uh, now, our telescope is not any of the observatories listed here. We have to type in the coordinates ourselves. So the coordinates are on your exoplanet data form. Let's enter those now. Uh, I've gotten pretty close to them already. So we want 37.071 for north. We want minus 119.413 for east. Uh, and it's in Pacific time, so make sure that you highlight the right time zone. It's on in California, so it is in Pacific time. Now, when it comes to finding the date, what we want, what we need from you guys is, first of all, we need to find an exoplanet that transits on a Wednesday. And it also has to be a Wednesday at least three weeks from now. So right now it's Thursday the 5th, three weeks from now, Wednesday would be about the 25th. So we're gonna try that. Mm, let's be safe and try October 2nd instead. We only need one day here because we can only shoot on Wednesdays. So one day is fine. On to the next section, this is the constraints. So this will help narrow down our selections in exoplanets. So at ingress means when the planet starts to pass in front of its star, we need it to be 30 degrees above the horizon at least and same goes for when it's leaving because where our telescope is there's a roof and the roof may get in the way of our data so we want to make sure it's high enough up off the horizon that we can see it don't need to worry about hour angles right now and this is this is called out of transit baseline essentially what we need is an hour before one hour before and after um this planet starts to cross in front of its star just so we can get an idea of how bright the star is on its own Fine. Now we need to get to the depth. Only show transits with the transits with a depth of at least. We need this to be 10 millimeg, and that means that we can see a good. That's a pretty big dip in how bright the star gets. Millimegs are just a, a unit for brightness. Um, so we can see a pretty significant dip in how bright the star is uh, when this planet passes in front of it. We also need to show targets so stars that are brighter than B13. This particular scale of magnitude is weird. Um, the larger the number, the dimmer the object is. So, for example, Pluto is about magnitude 14. Uh, Jupiter, on average, again, this is, the planets go around the, the sun, so they're bright at different points in their, in their um, orbits. But Jupiter is, on average, about minus 2. And Saturn, on average, is 1.15. So we need our star to be a little bit brighter than Pluto at, at magnitude 14. All right, that's all we need. So just to double check on that, we need... Our date on a Wednesday, more than three weeks from now. Our location for our particular telescope, the right Pacific time. One day after, 30 degrees at ingress and egress. Um, 12, minus 12 and 12, you can just leave that and leave the one. And then we need transits of at least 10 millimag deep and V13. Let's go. Alrighty. Here's a big giant table that summarizes uh, all of our information that we have and we need that and all the information incidentally that's in your form The first thing I look at when we get to this is the percent of transit visible because This is like an ultimate ruling out factor So this needs to be we need to see almost a hundred percent of both of all of this So this whole thing needs to be blue right now What we're seeing if you want to look at these numbers down here What we're seeing is that we can see nine percent of the transit So that's what this says up here percent of transit is outside of the brackets means this is 9% of the transit here, and we can see 50% of the baseline, so that's the latter half, the second half. So not good. What we want is a pretty full one. Okay, this is pretty good. This is as good as we're gonna get today. 
Um, if you don't have, if you can find one on another day a little bit later that covers all of this and not is not missing that last little bit there, that's better. But for sake of example, we're going to use this. So we've got our, uh, when you're filling out your form, this will be on there. It's the percent of transit and the percent of baseline visible. So fill out those two numbers uh, on this little, this little graph here. If you want as well, you'll notice that this highlights the start and end time in UTC. That's going to be available. Um, UTC is a, a unit essentially of time that relates to the time in essentially in Greenwich. Um, it just keeps it standard. So this shows us that we're going to go with this star more or less. Uh, now, first of all, we want to write down the date. That's October 2nd. Uh, this just tells us when it's going to be dark enough to take photos. This here will tell us the name of our star and our planet and help us find it. So the name is WASP44b. Um, now, the way the naming convention works, WASP44 is the star. And when there's a letter, that tells you which planet is following it. Uh, in almost all the cases that we're looking for, it'll only be a one planet system. So it'll just be a, the letter B, but there are other systems that have lots of planets. We can take a look at this just to make sure too, this is the finding chart and, and it has where everything's gonna be. So you take a look at this, perfect. This is what our star looks like. What we want is generally speaking, not much in this circle. You'll occasionally find stars that have stuff in the way here. We wanna make sure that it's pretty clear. That's because when we go to analyze it, Anything that's in the circle that's about this big uh, will affect the brightness of this. And we don't want that. We want just the brightness of our, our target star and nothing around it. So far, so good. Let's look at the rest of the things. We've got, this is the, the brightness of the star that we're looking at, 12.9 B, that's that B value. Um, so we're good, that's a below, technically speaking, 13. So that means it's brighter than 13. Um, and the moon is at 26%, so it's a quarter full, but it's 108 degrees away from our target, which is great. It's ideal to have it at more than 90 degrees away, especially if it's in the later phases, so like the brighter phases of the moon. Um, <clears throat> but you will see that this will be the wrong color uh, if the moon is relatively full and close to the target. So it'll be whatever that color is, red, brown, something like that, um, if there's an issue here with the moon. Let's take a look at our start, mid, end times. Now, these and then the um, elevation, azimuth, and hour angle have five readings. And this is where that, that chart comes in lower down on your page, the predicted values. Um, what it says up here in the chart title, it says start, mid, end. That's what the uh, black font is. And then the gray font or whatever color else there, the sort of like lighter font, um, is the time that we asked it to see ahead of. So for example, we want to see for an hour beforehand. So this gives us the what, what is on our sheet as the start time, the ingress, so that's when the planet starts to pass in front of its star, the midpoint, the egress, and the end time. It also has that, this is in, in local time, so that's in Pacific time. It also has it in UTC over here, so make sure that you write down both. Um, additionally, just a little note, when you are writing down the date of this transit, what you want to write it down, and you can write it down for your own notes that it's going to be Wednesday, October 2nd, because that's what it'll be as us humans here on the same continent as this object. But in UTC time, that's actually the following day. So make sure that you write down this in UTC and indicate that it's in UTC when you're selecting, when you're writing down the date for your transit. One quick mention uh, when it comes to time zones. So you'll notice that in, in Pacific time, um, the ingress is at 11.54 p.m. and then in UTC it's at 6.54 a.m. So UTC in this point is seven hours ahead. So there's a little spot to s when it says difference between Pacific time and universal time where it says in minus seven or minus eight. In this case you want to circle minus seven because PC or sorry Pacific time is seven hours behind UTC time. When daylight savings time ends, it'll be eight hours behind UTC. So make sure that you circle whichever is right for you. Um, it'll come across in the data when you write it down anyway, with the, when you write down UTC and PC, uh, Pacific time, but it'd be nice for us to have if you could just circle either minus seven if it's currently daylight savings time or minus eight if it's not. Okay, so make sure you write down those numbers. We've also got the duration of the transit here. So that's how long uh, this the, this planet is going to be passing in front of its star, so two and a half hours, sorry, two hours and a, 15 minutes. Um, 
we've got, this is the Julian date. Julian dates are weird. Uh, if you're curious about them, we have an answer to that question as to what they are in the FAQ. Um, so this here on this form only tells us the ingress, midpoint, and egress of the planet. It doesn't have those little fuzzy, fuzzy notes, fuzzy numbers above it. It just has those three numbers. So that's why on your form that you're filling out, there's two gray spots for the start, quote start, and the quote end um, for the predictive values. We'll find those when we actually do the imaging because the files will tell us when the Julian dates are. We've got our elevation. So this is um, how far above the horizon the planet is. Now, here's the tricky part. We ask it to give us above 30 degrees. Uh, so it's above 30 degrees for most of the night, except for at the very end. So that's why we're missing this section here. And you can see, for example, with this one, it's above 32 degree, or 30 degrees only in the second half. That's why it's missing this section here. So, I mean, it's not the end of the world. 25 degrees, it might run into the roof, but it may still be worth trying. So we've got our transit line here. If you want, you can draw a picture of it on your sheet. doesn't really matter. I like it because it's visual. Um, and we have the main thing is that we need the percentage of the transit here and the percentage of the baseline that you can see. Then we've got our azimuth. So this is these two numbers together, the elevation and the azimuth, let us track it across the sky at night. It tells us where it's going to be. Um, so this is all fine. And we're going to get into the hour angle. Now, the hour angle um, is a series of negative and positive numbers. This is weird. So essentially, straight through the middle of the sky from north to south is zero. So if it's on one side of that, it's a negative, and it's on, if it's on the other side of that, it's positive. This matters because the telescope can't go through that midpoint. It needs to flip itself upside down. And when it flips itself upside down, it leads to all of the images being upside down in the second half. So that's called a meridian flip. And you'll want to write these numbers down because if you have a negative turning into a positive, it means that you're going to have to flip some of your images. We have a tutorial for that, no problem, but it's something to be aware of. So then you'll need to do a meridian flip. If we were doing this one, for example, they're all negative. We don't have to do a meridian flip. It's all on one half of the sky. Next, we have the right ascension and declination. Don't worry about doing it in degrees. We just need it here. Uh, and so right ascension declination is sort of like GPS units for um, your star. It tells us exactly where in the night sky it is, and that helps the telescope to find it. So make sure you write those two down. We've got the period. So that's how many days in Earth days it takes for our uh, planet to go around its star. So for this one, it's 2.42 days, uh, so almost two and a half days. And then we have the depth of the transit, and this is um, essentially, it's a weird one. It's in PPT. It's in parts per thousand. So this is essentially how much the brightness drops when the planet goes in front of it. We have two spots to fill this out. We have the PPT spot, and then we have the millimag spot. You have to do a tiny bit of math to turn it into millimags. You just take this and you multiply it by 1.0863, and that gets you uh, to millimags. Alrighty, so that's all the information we have in this uh, in this file here. The one thing that we're missing is when moonrise and moonset is. So in your sheet, there's an, a link. If you follow that link, it'll take you to um, the moonrise and moonset in a town near the telescope. So I'm just going to copy that link and paste it in here. All right, there's the link. This takes us to the moon phases for Aubrey, which is near where our telescope is. And so we've got, um, what day are we looking? October, was October 2nd or 3rd? It's October 2nd into the evening. All righty, let's take a look. So it would be technically, oh, look, looks like we're good. So October 2nd, October 3rd, um, the moon is rising at 9, 11, 19 a.m. and it's setting at 9.43 p.m., which means that when we start taking data, which is at 11.54 p.m., the moon will already have set because this is, sets at 9.43. So you can write down that the moon is setting at 9.43, and for moonrise, you can just leave a dash because it's not happening again. So we're good. Perfect. The moon should be out of our way for our imaging. Oops, sorry, this one here, the imaging here. That's everything you have to write down. You can start doing research on your exoplanet to make sure it's one that you're really interested in. Try to find, if you're working as a group, try to find several targets as options, just in case some don't work or some do. 
Uh, so make sure you fill out those forms and send them on back to me at jenna.hines at rask.ca. And we'll make sure that your stars are good targets to be taking photos of. Thanks for watching and we'll see you guys in the next video.